morning, beloved. You may have a seat if you can. This is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. This morning, I'd like to share a very familiar story with you. A few years back, a young lady went off to college. Great. Here we go again with that story about the elephant. I mean, don't you have another story to prove your point? I've heard it like three times this year already. And you know what? It's not even that funny. Yeah, I said it. Not even funny. Maybe I should fill out one of those comment cards. It's not like I'm asking all that much. I come here every Sunday or so for some coffee, fellowship, and to hear a new message. The least you can do is make it fresh and insightful and funny and moving and theologically sound and historically accurate every week. Maybe I am asking too much. Probably way too much. I mean, Pastor did visit Joe in the hospital and celebrated with us when Michelle was born and was there when Susan lost her mom and encouraged me to fight for my family when we were on the brink of separation. Now that I think about it, Pastor's been like a counselor, a mentor, and a friend when I needed it the most. Pastors are awesome. Go ahead, Pastor. Tell that story again. I'll even laugh this time. pastor's heart is protective and guards his flock from Satan's snares. A pastor's heart is attentive and seeks to know his people's cares. A pastor's heart is sacrificial for his sheep and will give it all. A pastor's heart is tender and listens to the Spirit's call. A pastor's heart is obedient and heeds the master's commands. A pastor's heart is reflective and considers he is but a man. Thank you from your flock, Unity Children.
reflection is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Let us listen to God's word. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold him firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Call to confession. O Lord, our God, we give you thanks for the grace that is at work in us through the gift of our baptism. By the power of your Holy Spirit, poured out upon us in baptism, let your grace and peace grow in us. The prayer to confession. O Lord, Now stand firm in your faith, covered by the saving grace of God, and ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thanks be to God. Now please stand, and let's take this opportunity to share God's peace with everyone. Let's hope everybody is still appreciative after the sermon this morning. I'm sure you will be after we celebrate the sacrament of baptism, which is our greatest joy this day, to welcome new disciples into the flock. Let us pray. Almighty God, it is your word that is a guide for the living of our lives, especially as we seek to be disciples that make a difference. Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us wisdom. And may your word dwell with us so that it may indeed guide us in and through all things. In Jesus' name, hallelujah and amen. 
In today's passage scripture I shared with you at the beginning of the worship service, we see a potential disciple seeking after Jesus. Much like we might pursue being a follower of Jesus. The young man is seeking after Jesus. He runs up to Jesus. And in an act of humility, bows down before Jesus. And immediately, Jesus recognizes the attributes of this disciple. The attributes of discipline that this potential disciple has been practicing since he was a young boy. As this young man knows and is being obedient to the commandments of his faith tradition, Jesus affirms these things. And Jesus looks at him, and he loves him. He loves him. And then he acknowledges the one thing that is hindering this young man from fully following Jesus forward, his wealth. This young man's understanding of his wealth is a hindrance to him to following Jesus fully. Now, Jesus is familiar to this hindrance for all who seek to follow him. In fact, Jesus knows that money and possessions can be a hindrance in our ability to follow Jesus. Because as several people have observed in their study of the scriptures... Jesus talks more about money and possessions than about any other topic except the kingdom of God. Jesus talks more about money than he does about prayer. He talks more about possessions more than he talks about death. He talks more about money and possessions than about forgiveness. Jesus and his early followers are acutely aware that there's an intimate connection between faith and finances. A connection that can either threaten faith or strengthen faith. It was one of the issues that Jesus took up with the religious leadership of his time because they managed the wealth of the temple. And all the commodities of trade that were a part of the rituals of that faith tradition. It is the power of money that is part of Jesus' ultimate betrayal. You see, what Jesus wants is not your finances. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. Jesus wants nothing more than to be in relationship with you and to have your heart turned towards him. Jesus and others in the New Testament, however, understand and see money and possessions as threats because they can turn one's heart away from Jesus. As Matthew 6, 24 proclaims, no one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You see, when wealth becomes the object of one's trust, then wealth has taken the place of Jesus Christ. Now, before you let yourself off the hook, because you don't see yourself as wealthy, because you compare yourself with someone else who is incredibly rich, let us consider the wealth of our lives. In his book, Ask, Thank, Tell, Charles Lane states, you are wealthy by any standard. Historically, it has been observed that sometime in the 1950s, Western society achieved a standard that had never existed in the history of the world. 
the majority of people in the Western world were not living from hand to mouth. The majority of people had more than enough to meet today's needs and were thus able to have discretionary income and save. Fifty years later, the situation has obviously expanded. The majority of people in the Western world have considerable discretionary income, and they have way more than enough to cover the costs of food, clothing, and shelter. We in the Western world are also wealthy. Most people are. For many, this is a life changing experience to discover that they have more in common with their very wealthy friends of my own country than I have in common with the average citizen of a third world country. So, how do you evaluate the wealth of your life? It is not only a monetary measure that we should be using, but that has what has become such a powerful and divisive major measure in our Western culture. As Charles Lane continues in his understanding of wealth and its hindrance to following Jesus, The point of these passages is not that money in and of itself is evil. Rather, the point is that wealth has a way of luring us to trust in it. Wealth has a way of convincing us to take our future on our accumulation of it. To stake our future on the accumulation of wealth. Wealth has a way of tricking us into thinking that without it we are nothing. When we fail and fall into this trap, we have started trusting in something other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As stewardship followers, we need to be honest with ourselves about the role of wealth in our lives. If you would really evaluate this young man's life, you may discover that He was probably a rather prudent man by Western culture standards. We would probably want to lift him up for how he handled his wealth and managed it. So how do we, as followers of Jesus, as followers, as disciples who want to make a difference, how do we measure the wealth so that it does not get in the way of our relationship with Jesus? We need to begin by gaining a good understanding of what we are called to do with the stewardship of our full expanse of life. And no, I'm talking beyond your finances. I'm not talking about your sense and definition. I am talking, rather, about your sense and definition of what ownership is. The word stewardship originated from the root word sty ward, the ward of the pigs, the sty ward, the ward of the pig sty. The steward of the pig sty had to tend to the pigs for the true owner, not for his benefit, but for the benefit of the owner. So this is where I would like you to begin to evaluate the stewardship of your calling as a disciple. You are not the owner of any of it, despite what the Western culture has taught you about ownership. You are stewards of all that God owns, and he has enabled you to participate in the stewardship of his creation and everything in it. So how are you doing with your pigsty? Your responsibilities for the owner of all creation. That's the question I 
throw out to you today because I want you to expand your understanding of the wealth you have. Because wealth is not about a dollar amount. Because that ends up being some line of differentiation between incomes. And we sure have a way of dividing ourselves in that manner in our society. And cultural evaluations of finances and economics. What has the Lord truly given to you to be stored over? The skills and abilities and attributes you've been given to care for, for your own well-being and the well-being of family, the well-being of friends, the well-being of others. What have you been given to be stored of? In a family of faith, we have been given relationships we must store. And sometimes those relationships bring great challenges. So let me bring our understanding of stewardship and wealth into our act of faith that we're engaging in today, the sacrament of baptism. Today in the sacrament of baptism, for these two young children, we are acknowledging that God has a claim on each of these children as their creator, as their redeemer, and as the one who has empowered them by the Spirit to guide the course of their lives. God has blessed each of these families with this faith family and given them the stewardship responsibility for the forming of these children's lives to the glory of God and to the enjoyment of their own hearts. What a privilege we have today as stewards of these lives. What a source of joy we have as stewards of these young lives. What a responsibility we have as stewards of these young lives. You see, as disciples of Jesus, we have a responsibility to steward all the wealth of our lives to the glory of God. Not just the managing of our finances, but the manage of the wealth God has given us to store it over to his glory. Are you discipling your use of the wealth to care for your well-being and the well-being of others? In today's passage scripture, we discover the core meaning of stewardship and how giving should be a spiritual discipline. And during the upcoming weeks, we'll continue to explore how the stewardship of our lives makes a difference as we seek to be disciples for the kingdom of Jesus Christ in this world, especially as we explore the new mission phase that is unfolding before the church and this congregation in the weeks and months and years ahead, and how our emotional health, physical health, mental health, and spiritual health are all part of the wealth of life we have been given. But for now, let us just simply embrace the joy and delight of supporting God's primary caregivers for these little children as we all seek to be good stewards of all that we have been given as disciples of the kingdom here on earth so it might be as in heaven. Alleluia and amen. I invite those who desire their children to be baptized to please come forward. Don't be bashful. Oh, I know, I know. And we got a camera that we got to get everybody in. So, hey, you checking it out? Good. Yeah. Oh. Do you remember when you got wet? Okay. All good. My friends, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hear also these words from Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. This day, my friends, obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection by water and the Holy Spirit. We are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. So, my friends, let us remember the joy of our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. Sean, Leo, Ron, and Katie. Do you desire that Sarah and Callahan be baptized, do you? We do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child, do you? We do. I invite Corey and Dawn, and on behalf of Polly also, Dawn, because we know that's the more powerful voice of the two. <laughs> Will you, by your prayers and witness, help Sarah and Callahan to grow into the full stature of Christ? Will you? Do you, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Sarah and Callahan by word and deed, with love and prayer, do you? And will you encourage Sarah and Callahan to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of his church, will you? Through the sacrament of baptism, we enter the covenant God established in Jesus Christ. And within this covenant, God gives us new life, strengthens us to resist evil, and nurtures us in love. Through this covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. Sean and Leah, Ron and Katie, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Do you proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you? And will you be Christ's faithful disciple? obeying his word and showing his love, will you? Now with the whole church, let us rise and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father. And he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. And join with me in prayer as the waters of baptism are poured and we offer thanksgiving to the provider of all things. Let us pray. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. 
In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos and called forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. It was you who led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land. And by the waters of the Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, O God, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death, and from it we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. In these moments, send your spirit to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it. Raise them to new life and engraft them into the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Sarah and Callahan, that they may have power to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ. To you be all praise, honor, and glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Alleluia and amen. Hey, hey Sarah. Little one. Come on. Can come with me? Come on. Can you go with me? Hey, Sarah. Wow. You got Debbie with you? Yeah. Where are we going? Do you like water? No. No, you need data? Okay, Data, come on over. Hold that. Hold, hold Sarah. The security of dad is a good thing. Sarah, Jean, Hart. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know. I think she's a choir member. What do you think? Okay, Callahan. We all good, buddy? Hey. Yeah, you can come over and watch. Come on over, William. Come on over, Sawyer. You can watch. Yeah. Callahan, Mitchell, Copridge, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Ah, what do you think? You want to go with me and show them off? Okay, let's go. Come on, Dad, you can go with me. Okay? Yeah, we're going to go for a little walk. These are our newest disciples. And it is our responsibility, it is our stewardship of life to nurture their faith to show them what God is love means and to surround them with our prayers encourage them by our words and our actions so that each may grow and be nurtured to the fullness of their capacity to be a disciple of the kingdom of Jesus Christ and this world and beyond. Okay, guys, good. All right, we're going to turn around and let us rise and sing together.
Let us unite our souls together in the sacred practice of prayer. God, you are the one who gives us joyful days and abides in our aching days. Give thanks that we can trust you with the heaviest parts of our hearts as well as the joys of our lives. In the midst of an avalanche of challenging news, we still are able to spot the sliver of a moon at night that beautifies your creation. We can look around and see the beauty of the fall foliage transitioning around us, and we can see the delight of children's smiling faces. So our prayers are punctuated with gratitude. Indeed, on this day, hear both our cries and laments, as well as our songs of joy, O God. <clears throat> as we utter words of lament, because we yearn for a better world, we ask that you bring to life your plans for wholeness and well-being to the fulfillment of all. Heal our conflicting madness and teach us the ways of peace with one another, especially in the midst of a polarized society and divisions that surround us. Breathe new life into your people by the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Stir our compassion and energies for those overburdened in these days. We pray for health care workers and teachers and administrators and frontline providers and a whole a range of challenging days. And we thank you for small signs of kindness and possibility in the days that are bleak like the bird perched on a bare branch, or the touch of a hand of kindness towards us, or the familiar tune of baby giggles. A God we carve out in the silence of our hearts, our yearnings for those most dear to us. We pray for Lucy Cotner and Ruth Marone, Kathy Aspinall, 10-year-old Reagan and 5-year-old Joey and Dawn Korth, among a multitude of people who need your abiding presence this day. And we ask that you would continue to walk beside those who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death in this season of grief and mourning. For the Sterling family, the Schultz family, and all who have had to endure a long season of bereavement due to the impact of the pandemic. Like the Virginia Fife family and the Monica Ide family. And so many more during the course of this last year plus. Listen to our thoughts, O oh God. And receive our gratitude for small signs of possibility and fresh hope that sparkles amidst all the challenges and difficulties we're encountering day by day. Continue to provide laughter that surprises us. Help us to see the imagination of children as a hope for our future. The enjoyment of a crisp apple. The promising notes of a joyous song we know by heart. We are grateful that you hear our prayers, whether we are brimming with joy, seething with anger, crying out for justice, or sighing with grief. You hear our hearts, O oh God. And so hear us now as we turn to the reliable words of the prayer for all our days, the one that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, to share a little understanding of our expanding and extending 
the gifts of our lives to others, the wealth of our lives to others, is Elder Mike Clusen. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church in Green Tree. To everyone here in the sanctuary, or watching on streaming video, or on video later on. This is the time of year we do start thinking about the peacemaking offering, which is a mission offering, which, some, which is something the church at large is actually required to do according to scripture. The Peace and Global Witness Offering was established in 1980, which builds on the Presbyterian commitment to peacemaking. 50% of this peacemaking offering goes to the PCUSA to support missions around the globe. 25% goes to mid-councils to unite and support various missions in our region here. And the other 25% stays right here at the church to help us to do the same thing in missions. Because we at Unity are a mission-oriented church, this offering is important to us as a church. The peacemaking offering not only helps students who need help or people in need of food locally and many other things, it also helps people like Natalie Pesarek. Natalie was severely depressed and was contemplating suicide. Natalie testified in her church, the first, the first Presbyterian church in, of Boonton, New Jersey, <clears throat> about how hard and difficult that time was, and only those who have been there know how it feels. Natalie recollected the turning point in her life when she was walking through a wooded area across a field, contemplating how she would end the pain, when a beam of light, of warm sunlight, hit her in the face as she entered the field. It was at that exact moment she realized that she was making a terrible mistake. It was like God was saying to her, what are you doing? You have a reason to live. Natalie found herself compelled to address the growing mental health crisis, not only by sharing her story with her congregation, but getting her congregation more involved. The church's board of deacons voted to designate the church's share of the peacemaking offering to the New Jersey chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide. Prevention for Suicide Prevention, which is an organization that Natalie had participated in for years, and sadly and tragically, as Natalie said, her community lost more people to suicide in 2020 than to COVID-19. This is just one of the many stories here at home or around the world where the peacemaking offering can make a difference in people's lives. You can give to the peacemaking offering by either going to the church's website, unitypresbyterianchurch.org, all one word, scroll to the bottom to where it says give, give on it, and follow the prompts and make sure you designate it for the peacemaking offering uh, so that we know what it's for. Or you can mail it to the office, and again, make sure you write on the envelope or check, peacemaking offering. Or you can put it right in the plate as you enter the um, sanctuary over there, um, using either the special envelopes in the, um, in the pews, or if there's not one there, use the blue envelopes, but again, write peacemaking offering on it so that we know what it's for. And please give what you can to make a difference in people's lives here at home and around the world, which is what the peacemaking offering does. And always remember, there is no contribution that's too small. If we all give a little, it adds up to a lot. So please give what you can to help people here and around the world in, in their time of need, whatever it, that need may be. Thank you for your support to the mission of this church to help people wherever they may be. Thank you very much. There are a couple other ways that we are moving forward. 
in our ministry and mission for the kingdom of Jesus Christ and connecting to the community that surrounds us. In a couple weeks, we will be hosting once again our trunk and tree. And you can see in the bulletin how you can participate in making that a festive occasion for the entire community. And the multitude of people come to see the care of this congregation for the children in the community. I'm going to also notify everybody that we are embarking on a new expansion of our ministry and mission when it comes to pets. As you know, we have had a pet blessing event every year for the last several years. And now we're engaging in next steps to make our pet ministry as a congregation go further and touch more lives. In addition to Pastor Petey, we'll be having some other pets interacting with others in the community, whether they be dogs or people or cats or other creatures of God's kingdom. You'll be hearing more about that. Also, in a couple weeks, you'll hear more about our missional support of the emotional health and mental health of people further as we realize this toll as a result of the pandemic. So I encourage you to pay attention, to be alert, to look for the Lord around you in and through all things so that you can be good stewards of everything God has given you in the course of the wonder of your life and its interrelationship with one another. Join with me in the prayer of dedication. Dear Lord, I give you my hands to do your work. I give you my feet to go your way. I give you my eyes to see as you see. I give you my tongue to speak your words. I give you my mind that you may think in me. I give you my spirit that you may pray in me. Above all, I give you my heart that you may love in me. Love the Father and love all humankind. I give you my whole self, Lord that you may grow in me, so that it is you who lives, works, and prays in me. Amen.
has usually been our tradition on a day when we've celebrated the sacrament of baptism to have the families come forward and stand here and have all of us greet them. Not a wise thing to do these days. So we ask that you do, as you depart, perhaps give them a wave of blessing to extend your hand to them. And beyond that, extend your prayers to them because that's the thing they fully need. We do have some extra goodies today in the lounge for everybody to share in the joy and delight of this day the Lord has made. But now, my friends, go into all the world to be disciples that make a difference. Be the ones who God has created to love the world. The ones who are to extend Jesus Christ to all with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit guiding your way this day and forevermore. Alleluia and amen.